A faulty fan, as used in bathrooms in the UK, that has a built-in timer so that it's hooked into the lighting. When you turn the light switch on, the fan starts, and then when you turn the light switch off, it's got a continuous feed to it, so the fan will keep spinning even after the light's off for a certain length of time. And this was sent by Will, alias Physic Mad, on YouTube, and he said there were two things that went slow over time in this fan. It seemed to have lost the ability of continuing for a certain time after it was switched off. That switch-off delay slowly shortened and shortened. The second thing that went wrong was that it was gradually having trouble spinning up. It would seem to hang when powered on for a few seconds, then spin up. Now it seems to just hang continuously with a hum, and then what appears to sound like overcurrent protection kicking in. Okay. Well, for a start, it is free to run. If there's a capacitor involved in this, I shouldn't be seeing these things. You're supposed to be diagnosing this. Let's pop the lid. I've kind of given it away there, haven't I, to a degree, what I think might be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe it isn't that. We'll find out when we take a look at the circuitry. Now, before I open this, I'll say the circuitry in these usually is super cheap and simple. It might be capacitive dropper based, or more likely it's just a resistor and maybe a CMOS chip, because that is what it often is. I see a big resistor. Is it going to be a 4 series chip? Maybe a Schmidt trigger, perhaps? It's a 4001, which is a... St it's not a Schmidt trigger, I don't think. It's just a standard CMOS chip. Uh, let's try this out. What are the connections in here? Um, permanent lab supply is brown. Uh, switch supply is white and black is neutral. Let's power it up and see what happens. So I shall strip the wires. Where's a stripper? Can't immediately see a stripper. I shall just use my schnips. Nibble, nibble. Strip. Oh, that's quite chewy cable. That is very chewy cable. How very unprofessional of me daring to use just my snips like that. I noticed the earth wire is cut off in here, so I'm not going to bother stripping the earth wire. Afterwards, I'll take out the circuit board and I shall reverse engineer it. So we can take a look at the circuitry. I'm not immediately seeing domed capacitors in here, just for reference, but we can take a look at this after. There is a little potentiometer there for calibrating the speed. Right, tell you what, let's get the, uh, let's get the, the quick test up. This is going to be a bit tricky because uh, actually, you know what, let's just use the hoppy because I may need to dab a wire on. So here's the hoppy, uh, what's the, black is the neutral, should cut these a bit shorter but not to worry, brown is the live and white is the switched live, okay, so I shall dab this wire on, please note, don't emulate what I'm doing, I'm an idiot and therefore all electrical safety precautions should be covered, the thing isn't running, what happens if I dab this wire on? Nothing happens. The unit is drawing about one watt. A bit more than one watt. That's from that two watt resistor, which is probably getting hot. Okay, it's completely dead. Excellent. That's a good start. My guess, this is just a guess, is that one of these capacitors may be a simple power supply, and the other one may be for timing. But we shall take this out, this circuit board out, and we'll see what happens. Uh, so I shall just whip that out right now. One moment, please. Okay, the circuitry has been reverse engineered. Let's explore it. The incoming power supply is created by this resistor here, and you can see it's been getting very hot. It's just the cheapest way they could do it. And it's creating a very simple power supply with a diode for uh, polarity, um, and a smoothing capacitor, a very small smoothing capacitor, and then a Zener diode that actually clamps that down to about 15 volts. There is a logic chip that is doing all the sort of processing. It's not really that complicated. It's, it's basically a logic chip, and then it's driving a little MOSFET. The logic chip, to show you what's inside this, it's really, it's very old-fashioned. It's a very much a bread-and-butter CMOS logic. Uh, in this case, it's a quad NOR. NOR means it's got two inputs, and the N at the beginning of NOR, as opposed to OR, rep 
indicates that it's got this little circle in the output which inverts the output. In logic gates, you have a high or a low state. In the case of this, uh, this circuit's actually running about 15 volts, which is fine for the CMOS chips. So a high is somewhere up near this 15 volt region, and a low is near this 0 volt region. In this case, the way these work is that uh, a high on either of the inputs will actually make the output go low. And it's just four of those blocks. Very simple. It was a very, very popular chip in the heyday of logic. Kind of, everybody's using microcontrollers now, but that's a cheap, low current, super low current way of doing it, which kind of works with this resistor. Well, tell you what, before I'll show you the schematic, so just if you want to try and reverse engineer it yourself, take a wee snapshot of this, and then I shall bring the schematic in. I have all the components ready to have we go at fixing this once you have diagnosed the problem. So here's live come in, and there's neutral. The neutral is effectively the zero volt rail of the whole circuit. It's not actually, it's zero volts to the circuit's reference, but obviously you wouldn't want to touch it. Technically speaking, it will be effectively at zero volts to, to ground as well, but uh, it's, yeah, it's connected to neutral. That's the main thing to know. Live uh, is feeding the circuitry with power. It's also going to the fan, and then the neutral uh, is switched via this triac. To generate its 15 volt supply, it has that high power, very hot running resistor, which is uh, dissipating over a watt of power, a standard one amp diode, and then the 47 microfarad 16 volt capacitor, and then a 15 volt Zeno diode across that. That then powers the logic chip, the two power pins of the logic chip, and one of the gates is just parked. When you're not using a gate in the logic chip, you can't just leave the pins floating, you have to connect them to the zero volt rail or even the high rail if you want, just as so long as they're tied to a known logic state. There is a 15k resistor which is pulling the input to this gate up high. And that means that uh, when the light switch hasn't been turned on, because this is what's sensing the light switch, um, when the light switch isn't turned on, it pulls this uh, the input to this gate up high. When the light switch is turned on, uh, the current travels via this 270k resistor to limit it. There's a Zener diode here to cap that, but it's effectively, because it's AC, it's actually pulling the input to this negative, which kind of uh, basically means that the output, because it's inverting, will go positive in a series of sort of like, probably a, pretty much a square wave. When it does that, as soon as it goes positive, current flows through this diode and charges up this capacitor here, which is 470 microfarad, 470 microfarad, 16 volt and that is the timing capacitor all that happens now is that charges up uh, the input of this gate then goes high and that output then goes low and then it turns the input of that low which means the output of that goes high see this is the, the peril of inverting logic and turns the uh, the triac on via this resistor all this one's only being used as an inverter to correct that sort of the logic level state not quite sure why they did it this way, but you know what, they must have had their reasons. It's a very classic chip used for applications like this. The time delay, when this is turned off, this capacitor is no longer pumped uh, positive by this diode, and that is held up high, so this then output goes off, and the capacitor can now discharge. The capacitor is discharged by two resistors, a, a fixed 200k resistor and a variable potentiometer, this one here, uh, which appears to be... a it's just marked CO5. I couldn't see a marking of the actual value on it. But I reckon it's roughly about 220k. That's a nice round value. Could be 200k, 220k. But uh, the closer that is to this end, the higher the resistance in the circuit, so actually it's going to take longer to discharge this capacitor. The closer it is to that end, the lower the resistance, so it's going to discharge it faster. Um and that's going to result in a shorter time delay. Uh, and that's it. You know, it's got that simple power supply. It's got the detector for when the switch is on that pumps this capacitor up positive. Uh, that then detects a positive level and uh, turns on the track. And then when the light switch is turned off, that capacitor slowly discharges until it reaches the threshold that this will suddenly, uh, this input will turn off and effectively that will result in the track being turned off too. So what do you think is the faulty component here? My primary suspect, given the descriptions, is actually 
this capacitor here. So that's the first one we're going to actually try changing. Because uh, the description of the fault, the resistor reads okay. The description of the fault is that the fault happened progressively with the fan struggling to start up. And that actually is possibly suggesting that the triac wasn't being turned on fully. So it was as the voltage was peaking, because this wasn't smoothing properly, it was actually phase angle controlling the fan, and that would have meant it would be running at low power. But as this dried out even more, it just meant, means that it might not be able to make the logic operate stably and also not able to drive that. So let's try that. Let's zoom out. Get this out of the way. I shall brighten the image up by maybe taking a wee sample there and yeah, that'll do. Right, let's get this capacitor out. So I'm going to start by reflowing the solder slightly. And once I've reflowed it, that will make it more amenable to melting. And I'm going to remove it. I'm going to note which is the negative side. The negative side goes towards the potentiometer. I'm going to just rock this backwards and forwards by alternately heating the pads until it pops out. Then I'm going to bring in my desoldering braid. I've just dropped my desoldering braid. I'm probably going to add a little bit of flux to this because the flux makes things go better with desoldering braid. A lot better. This is where I should have thought about this in advance because this has a tiny little needle that is very prone to... Oh, there it goes. Yeah, I'll just mop that up with that. Mm -hmm. Super messy. Yes, uh, big huge mess. It's all right. It'll dry and disappear. So I'm going to clean those pads. The desoldering braid is just a copper braid with some flux in it. You can add flux, it makes it better. When you put it on, it just provides a nice surface for all that solder to suck into and gives you nice clean pads like that. You can't necessarily see that. I shall zoom down just a little bit so you can see it better. We shall put this in in exactly the same way it was in before with the lead splayed. Oh, it's got a positive mark there for that. Let's just jiggle it in like that and solder that. And then we'll connect some leads and we'll see what actually happens. Is it going to work? If it doesn't work, the next thing to suspect is the timing capacitor. Although I think that this is actually going to do it. I have a hunch. There'd be no harm if you had it open. If one's dried out, the chances are the other one's dried out. It gets hot in here. That is acting as a basically a radiator it's not it's not ideal right tell you what let's uh hook up the, these leads and we'll hook it up to the uh so that's neutral with the fan as well so that's the neutral i'm even using the right colors that's how that's been very good i will put that into the live and we'll just stuff the leads into the hoppy and I shall bridge the live to the uh, switch live later on with the uh, with a bit of wire. So where's the fan? The fan is over here. Let's pop these leads in here. The triac is a fairly high. Uh, gate current of about 7 milliamps. That is unusually high for a circuit like this. It'd be nice if it was more sensitive, but having said that, that's how triacs usually are. They're not super sensitive things. That is, I suppose, sensitive as triacs go. Okie dokie. Let's make sure there are no component crop leads to short things out. What I could also do, this capacitor, I could also bring in a little tester. Let's put in a little tester here. We'll put it in pins one and two. And we'll close it down and just see what it says, just out of interest. It's thinking about it. It's not doing anything. Is it? Oh, it says capacitor. It says 8,964 nanofarad, uh, equivalent C resistors, 150 ohms. That's too high. That's way too high. Okay. That is definitely an issue. Where's the... I could just use the quick test, but the 
Cliff Quick Test, but I shall stuff this in here. Not sure why I'm doing this. I suppose it'll let us check the fan out. So let's get this circuitry in here. Let's zoom back out so you can actually see everything happening or blowing up as the case may be. And let's plug this in. Nothing happens. This is good. That's what's supposed to happen at this point in time. Now I have to try and get a wire in without shorting between live neutral and making a huge bang. That's looking pretty good. And now it should hold on and run for a length of time. Okay. I would say that is fixed. I shall unplug that. What's it drawing? It's uh, 19 watts. The smell of farts is wafting out once more. So, uh, yes, that was the problem. It was the power supply capacitor. But as a precaution, it'd be a good idea to change this one as well. Uh, this capacitor that I was going to put in, if it was likely to, if it still wasn't working, is uh, a 25 volt one. I'd put in a higher voltage one because the 15 volts is pretty close to the, uh, the 16 volt rating of the capacitor. But there we go. That is the fix. So if you have one of these, and that problem occurs, then it's worth... I wonder if you think that mounts up the way if it did. That resistor. In some instances, if this had mounted up the way, that resistor would actually just be basically heating those capacitors. That's terrible. But then that's ultimately what happens. And look at all the space along here. They could effectively have positioned things. Oh, that's what they did. I suppose ultimately it depends what way up this gets mounted, where... where the components would have to be. But there we go. It's fixed, diagnosed, very simple, very odd, retro circuit, very cheap circuit, which is probably the main reason for it. Um, and the fan is now running. So um, did you manage to work out what's wrong? You may notice a, a common trend here of capacitors failing. It's just capacitors. These ones aren't super mega stressed, but heat would have been the main issue for these ones. Um, but they're not as stressed as modern capacitors in the sort of high frequency electronic applications. But they do just gradually dry out over time. When they dry out over time, the electrolyte just gradually seeps out as vapor and they go high impedance and uh, then they stop working. So there we go. Easy enough fix.